So I recently posted something on social media about uh, my frustration with the way that the press uh, and frankly, even sometimes the medical establishment writes about cholesterol, referring to good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Now, if you've ever listened to me on podcasts, you understand that I talk about this in, in great detail, but a number of the comments suggested that there were a lot of people that are kind of new to this discussion. They haven't necessarily followed me. They certainly haven't heard the, I don't know, literally 25 hours worth of content on cholesterol over the last four years on my podcast. And they were kind of looking for a little bit of, you know, call it the TLDR version of cholesterol. And I thought this would be a great excuse to do it. So if you want to understand why I, you know, wail on people when they say bad cholesterol and good cholesterol, you have to really understand what cholesterol is and why that type of imprecise language is unhelpful, to put it mildly. Okay, so let's take a step back. What is cholesterol? So cholesterol is a lipid. It is synthesized by every cell in our body. That means every cell in our body makes cholesterol. Okay, so why do we make this stuff? Well, this stuff is super important or every cell in our body wouldn't make it. It's essential for the creation of a cell. So a cell, you know, when you look at cells, when you look at a picture of a cell in a, you know, in a book or online or something, they look like two dimensional structures, right? They're sort of these flat things, but really that's not what cells look like. That's kind of a cut open cell projected onto 2D. The reality of it is cells are three dimensional and they are fluid, right? They have to be able to be more than just perfectly open spheres. So what gives them that fluidity is their membranes. And it's the cholesterol within the membrane that provides that fluidity. It's also what allows transporters to go across the surface of cells. These transporters are what allow various things like glucose, ions, hormones, et cetera, to traverse cell membranes. So it's important to understand that if we didn't have cholesterol, we wouldn't have cells. If we didn't have cells, I wouldn't be making this video and you wouldn't be here to watch this video. Okay, no cholesterol equals no life, full stop. There are things that are almost equally essential for life that go beyond that. Cholesterol is the precursor to some of the most important hormones in our body, which ranges from things like vitamin D to cortisol, to estrogen, to testosterone, progesterone, et cetera. It's also essential for bile acids. We wouldn't be able to digest most of our food without bile acids, especially fatty foods. So the list goes on and on as to why cholesterol is essential. Okay, so why does the story not end there? Why are we having this discussion? Well, when it comes to something as essential as cholesterol, not every cell in the body is capable of making enough cholesterol to meet its individual needs. So the body has to be able to traffic cholesterol. So there are certain cells that tend to be net exporters of cholesterol, the liver, for example, as a general rule, the liver makes more cholesterol than it needs. Whereas there are parts of the body that need more cholesterol than they are typically capable of making, especially during periods of high stress. So those parts of the body need to shuttle cholesterol, need to receive cholesterol. And this poses a little bit of a problem because the main channel that we like to use in the body to transport uh, things back and forth is of course the circulatory system. It is not the only system. We have a lymphatic system. But the circulatory system is the system that we tend to use uh, most to transport things like this. Now, there are lots of things we transport in the circulatory system, and we do without any difficulty, right? We transport glucose without any difficulty. We transport electrolytes without any difficulty. We transport lactate without any difficulty. Why? Because all of those things that I just stated are water soluble. And of course, the circulatory system is made up of plasma and proteins. That's what your blood is. The plasma being basically the water of the cell. And so things that are water soluble, like all of the proteins, hemoglobin and things like that, things that I already stated, glucose electrolytes, they are soluble in water and therefore they transport easily. But as I said at the very outset, cholesterol is a lipid. And if you remember a little bit from a chemistry class, you'll know that a lipid is not water soluble. It is hydrophobic as opposed to what we say is hydrophilic. So things that are hydrophobic can't move in water. Just as you would dump olive oil into a glass of water, you would quickly realize how much they repel each other. So we have this totally essential thing that we have to move around the circulatory system, otherwise we would die. And 
We can't do it directly because the medium through which we need to transport it repels the thing we're trying to transport. Aha, there's a solution. We need to create a vehicle that we can transport this in. And that vehicle is called a lipoprotein. And as its name suggests, lipo and protein, it's part lipid, part protein. And it's engineered in a way that the lipid part is on the inside. The protein part is on the outside. Protein is water soluble. So now you create this spherical molecule, which on the inside you can package the cargo that is hydrophobic, repels water. And on the outside, you have a coating that is hydrophilic, that is attracted to water and moves effortlessly through the water. And that's how we transport cholesterol. Now, broadly speaking, these um, lipoproteins traffic in two types of families. A family that is defined by ApoB, which is a lipoprotein that wraps around it, or an apolipoprotein that wraps around the spherical larger lipoprotein, and ApoA. There's an ApoA family, there's an ApoB family. Technically, there is another, there's two ApoB families. There's an ApoB100 and an ApoB48. I'm going to ignore the ApoB48 right now. That just exists on chylomicrons. And we could do another class on that in another day. But for now, we're going to focus on ApoB100, which defines the lineage of lipoproteins that are terms you've probably heard of, VLDL, IDL, LDL, LP, little a. And the ApoA lipoproteins define a totally different class of these called HDLs. So what do those names mean anyway? VLDL, IDL, LDL, HDL. They all refer to another feature of the lipoproteins that is distinct from the apolipoprotein that wraps around them, which is their density. So if you think about, you know, like a high school experiment where you take various different substances and you put them into water, you might notice that you can separate how they would float. Now, water is kind of a bad example of how that works because things are typically binary behaving in water, either they're sink or they're going to float. But I think that gives you a conceptual understanding of the difference in density. So density is mass over volume and a higher density object relative to a lower density object will sink versus float. So if you take all of those lipoproteins that I mentioned, all of the ApoB ones, all of the ApoA ones, and you put them in a certain type of gel in the lab, you can see a separation of them based on their density. And the highest density ones of those, we just call the high density lipoproteins, the HDLs. You have more than one ApoA on an HDL and you have different subclasses of HDLs. And HDLs are really complicated and we don't even come close to understanding all the ins and outs of them, which by the way is why I get really annoyed when people say having a high good cholesterol is good. Um, and what, again, what they really mean to be saying is having a high HDL cholesterol is good. And while it's true that on average, higher HDL cholesterol is associated with and traffics with meta metabolic health in a way that low HDL cholesterol tends to traffic with bad metabolic health, you can absolutely not tell by looking at an individual based on how high their HDL cholesterol is if they're in good shape or not. Because that single snapshot of how much cholesterol is in the HDL tells you nothing about the functionality of the HDL. And it's the functionality of the HDL that matters. I'm not going to talk any more about that because I have an entire podcast coming out on HDL biology at some point in the next few months where we'll go into that in great detail. Uh, but it should be reminded, uh, it should be stated that efforts to raise HDL cholesterol pharmacologically have by and large mostly, not exclusively, but mostly failed in uh, improving outcomes. Okay, so over on the LDL <clears throat> ApoB side, the most abundant ApoB100, or ApoB for short, lipoprotein is the low density lipoprotein. That's the one that gets called bad cholesterol. And again, on the ApoA side, we have HDL, which gets called good cholesterol. So a couple of things I wanna say on this. One, <clears throat> if you're talking LDL, you are referring to the low density lipoprotein. If you say HDL, you are referring to the high density lipoprotein. 
But if someone says, what is your HDL? What is your LDL? They're asking for a laboratory metric. They are asking incorrectly. There is no laboratory metric called LDL or HDL. There is HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, abbreviated LDLC and HDLC. There's LDLP and HDLP, which is the particle number of LDL, which can be counted via electrophoresis or NMR. Of course, my preferred way to count the number of these particles is to look at ApoB. The ApoB concentration to me is the most important number you want to understand to predict from a biomarker standpoint, your cardiometabolic risk uh, or ASCVD risk because it captures all of the atherogenic particles. So ApoB counts the total of the LDLs inclusive of the LP little a's, the IDLs, although they virtually never exist, they have such a short residence time and the VLDLs, which can become problematic in people with metabolic syndrome and high triglycerides. So ApoB gives you the total atherogenic burden of those lipoproteins. And therefore I think it's the preferred metric by which we want to assess risk. But if you want to look at LDL, you have to look at LDL-C, LDL cholesterol. And HDL, you have to look at HDL cholesterol. Now, is the cholesterol in the HDL any different from the cholesterol in the LDL? No, of course not. Therefore, it is totally erroneous to say HDL is good cholesterol and LDL is bad cholesterol. No, instead, what is true is that LDLs themselves as lipoproteins are bad actors because of what they do. What they do is they go into artery walls where they get oxidized and they basically dump their oxidized sterile contents into the subendothelial space, which elicits an, an immune response and a whole bunch of other things that lead to atherosclerosis, which I'm not gonna get into now. But the point of this discussion is that I want people to understand that LDLs and HDLs are lipoproteins. If you wanna talk about the cholesterol, you talk about LDL cholesterol and HDL cholesterol, but the cholesterol in them is the exact same. And there is no such thing as good cholesterol or bad cholesterol. And so you just have to be careful when you see things written that are written through that lens, because what it tells you is the person writing this doesn't understand the basics of lipids and lipoproteins. And if they don't understand the basics of lipids and lipoproteins, because what I just told you guys is literally the 101 on this subject, right? That we didn't get to the senior level class, let alone the graduate level class. And this is complicated stuff once you get into that level. So if someone writing to me is butchering the 101, you can stop reading because whatever else they're saying, they're undoubtedly screwing it up. Okay, so there it is. There's the TLDR on lipids.